Shalom, shalom, friends. It's a delight to be here today with the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, who is co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, with the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II, that organized the largest and most expansive wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in U.S. history. She's the director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice at Union Theological Seminary. She has spent over the past two decades organizing amongst the poor in the, in the U.S., and is the author of Always With Us, What Jesus Really Said About the Poor. She is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church, USA, and teaches at Union Theological Seminary in New York, in New York City. Uh, Reverend, thank you for making time to talk with us. Thank you so much for your interest. So how did we get to the point where there's over 140 million poor people in America? I mean, so... So first, I want us to pause for a second and really take in that number, right? 140 million. That's 43.5% of the U.S. population um, who are poor or one couple hundred dollar emergency from poverty, homelessness, destitution, right? Um, so that means that poor people aren't some little group over there that people have no connection to, but that if almost half of the U.S. population is poor or low wealth or low income. Uh, that means that pretty much everybody knows somebody or is themselves in that situation. Um, this has been happening over the course of, of years. It's not that 140 million people woke up today and said, we don't want to work or we don't, you know, uh, we're all going to do lots of drugs or, you know, these kinds of stereotypes that we have about who is poor and why people are poor, but that poverty has been structured into our society. Um, we have uh, policies that uh, benefit a very small number um, of people and that impoverish and make life miserable for very many people, right? So when we talk about, for instance, jobs and the economy, um, you know, it, it used to be up until about 1970, 73, that if you were working and as the economy grew, people's, uh, you know, like life was better. Um, it was this kind of notion of that a rising tide lifts all boats, right? But what's happened since the, the early 1970s is that our economy, our GDP, the, the stuff that we're producing in this nation can can increase and increase and increase and the profits of the corporations making that stuff and selling that stuff can increase and increase but we now have a third of the u.s workforce that lives um, that works uh at less than a living wage and in many states half of the u.s the half of the workforce 62 to 65 million people who are working for less than 15 dollars an hour uh, you know, there's not one town, city, or county anywhere in this country where if you're working full-time and making minimum wage that you can afford to even rent a two-bedroom apartment, right? And so, so one of the things is that somehow kind of profits and wages have gotten completely decoupled. And so we might have pretty, pretty full employment, though it actually isn't as full as it looks, um, but the wages that people are making, the standard of living that people are having is, is not keeping up with this kind of growing economy. And so people have to dip into their savings. You know, actually the United States has a negative savings rate, which is that people owe more than they, than they own, right? Whether that's their car, whether that's their house, whether that's their student debt. Um, and, and so that's part of the problem, right? Just that, that the economy is now just fully in the hands and control of a very few. Um, and, and that most of us are, are not actually benefiting from that. I mean, there's, there's other, other, you know, things as well. I mean, since 2010, 26 states have passed racist voter suppression laws. And then who cut, gets smuggled into office because of voter suppression is people who pass policies that cut, you know, food programs, that increase, um, spending for a wall at the U.S.-Mexico border um, to the detriment of the public health of people, right? And so, and in fact, our country spends 53 cents of every discretionary dollar on the military 
and less than 15 cents on healthcare, education, anti-poverty programs, and living wage jobs combined, right? And so, um, it's so so it's a it's a whole set of factors, and it's a complex issue. But what it means is that we have an immoral situation where the majority of people in this country are working hard, are trying hard, are caring for their communities and families, and they're not able to make ends meet. And, and therefore, we say we need a moral revolution of values and a revival of, of you know, our religious and constitutional traditions and values that say that how we treat the immigrant neighbor is how we honor and worship God. Wow, wow. Yeah, you know, it's pretty astounding to me that there's bulks of Americans who hold a theology and philosophy that actually it, the, those struggling financially, it is, it's, it's their fault. Yeah, there is not right. a systemic um, injustice uh, towards social mobility in this country, um, as, as, as you're talking about so, so, so eloquently. So let me ask you, so what, what inspired you to revive the Poor People's Campaign with, with uh, Reverend uh, Barber? So I've been working on developing something like a Poor People's Campaign since I learned about Dr. King and Cesar Chavez and the Welfare Rights Unions. Um, you know, Poor People's Campaign back in 67 and 68, which was probably actually about 25 years ago. I, I had gotten involved in very grassroots organizing amongst the homeless. Uh, I was in Philadelphia, but we were organized across the country. Um, and we were looking for moments in history when poor people across race, across geography had come together and tried to make life better um, and found this last campaign of Dr. King's that is actually really a forgotten campaign. Um, you know, uh, on some level, aspects of it were assassinated when he was assassinated. And so, um, you know, through, through those many years, been, you know, connecting with grassroots leaders, homeless folks, folks with raw sewage in their yard, people without health care, low-wage workers, and, and folks kind of coming together and saying, we need to come, you know, into some kind of united force come together across these lines that divide us and, and build a Poor People's Campaign for today. Now, about five, six years ago, Dr. Barber and I connected. Um, we were launching the Cairo Center that I direct and, and much of the, the um, launch event and, and purpose of the Cairo Center was as we approached the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign that we needed to reignite a new one for today. And so he came and he keynoted that. Um, and heard about, you know, grassroots leaders, homeless folks, welfare recipients, you know, um, low wage workers who were trying to restart it. And, and we said, you know, what if we kind of team up and, and we, we work on this together. And so, you know, where, where really the inspiration comes is from some of those 140 million poor and low income people, right? And, and comes as a reaction to that distorted narrative you were talking about just moments ago that blames poor people for all of society's problems, that tries to pit us against each other, and that, uh, and that also feeds us this lie of scarcity, that we can't do any better, that we can't really change this, that this has to be this way, this is as good as it gets when we actually are living in a world of beautiful abundance where nobody should be homeless, nobody that, should be without. Or that, uh, I'm so sorry to cut you off, um, or, that, or that the only alternative to solving this is some bankrupt political model called socialism or communism that used to exist, um, but this is the way in any just economy that it has to be, you know? So. Right, and, and not that like what we're finding, you know, that is deeply biblical, right? I find it in Deuteronomy um, where it says, uh, you know, when you lift from the bottom, that everybody rises, that, that a society that lends out money, that eliminates slavery, that forgives debts, that pays people what they deserve, is a society that everyone flourishes in, you know, and, and which sounds pretty different than the, the economy that we're living in today. But, but again, historically, we've seen that it doesn't have to be this way, and, and, and we can do better, and, and we must do better. So from one clergy person to another, um, a, a, as an ordained priest, uh, mm -hmm. what role does your religious identity, your religious values, religion in general, play mm -hmm. on the movement? I mean, you, you just naturally quoted a biblical verse. You know, is it mostly sort of intellectual, such as, you know, from verses, or how do you understand the role of spirituality and religion in your work? 
And yeah, so I, I was raised to see that practicing my faith meant doing social justice, yeah. you know, like Micah 6, 8, what is the, the, what does God require of you, but to do yeah. justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. Right. Um, and, and that you can't kind of separate out, um, your honor and worship of, of God from, from how you, you know, how you live in the world and, and the justice that you fight for, for everybody. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, I was a Sunday school teacher by the, the age of 13. I was a deacon in my church by 16. Right. Um, so, so my own path has always been doing this justice movement building work and from a faith perspective. Um, in the Poor People's Campaign, um, we are a multi-faith movement. Um, we have uh, people from really every faith tradition that, that, that exists in the United States and people that aren't of a faith tradition, that don't adhere to a faith. Um, for, for me, as an ordained clergy, as a biblical scholar, as, you know, a practicing Christian, um, you know, I am motivated uh, to do this work because of my study of my sacred texts, um, because of, you know, the, the tradition that I come from. Um, and, and, but, but how that's brought into the work is, is definitely through you know, theological debate and discussion and motivation and preaching, but it's also, you know, the kind of community of people that are coming together, again, that is an interfaith and multi-faith um, community, um, but that is, you know, is singing songs together, is doing art builds together, is, you know, protesting with our, our, our legs and praying with our feet, you know, together. And so, um, so, you know, all of those things come into play in this, in this work. Um, and, and it's been very powerful that 16 national faith bodies, you know, de whole denominations, whole, you know, faith communities that are organized on a national level have, have endorsed the Poor People's Campaign and, and bring their congregants, their communities, their congregations into this work and say, you know, it's not enough to just, you know, study these texts, um, say our prayers, go through our rituals, but we have to be doing that in the public square. Um, and, and that looks different, but that, but that we're called to do that together. Amazing. Amazing. So a, a, a question on intersectionality. Mm -hmm. uh, to what extent do you understand this work to be hyper-focused on uh, poverty? And to what extent do you understand it to be intertwined with a whole bunch of other issues, causes, and movements in America? And to what extent do you understand the um, addressing of poverty in America to be intertwined with global poverty? Yeah, so, I mean, so the Poor People's Campaign uh, takes on five kind of interlocking injustices, intersectional injustices. Um, we start with systemic racism, just because of the history of this country and the history of racism as an original sin in this country. Um, and we connect it, but, but systemic racism, not, not just interpersonal, you know, difference and, 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 um, uh, but, but, you know, how it's structured into our society, whether it's through unjust immigration policies, whether it's through mass incarceration, whether it's through racist voter suppression, right? But, th and then we connect that to poverty and in all of its forms, you know, the lack of healthcare, the lack of water, the lack of living wage jobs, the, um, you know, the lack of infrastructure, um, the, the attacks on housing, you know, these kinds of, you know, so in fullness, you know, um, and, and then we, we, you know, we started with racism and poverty and militarism because those were the three that Dr. King had talked about. Um, you know, he had talked about the tripartite evils of racism and economic exploitation and militarism and said that really the Achilles heel, the weak point of all three was uniting and organizing people who had nothing or little to lose from those systems. And those were poor people of all races and globally and in the U.S., right? Um, it was about connecting with the Vietnamese actually back in, in the late 60s. But then we said that that so we can start with those three because again you know today we spend even more money on the military and are less safe for doing so um you know most of that money goes to military contractors it doesn't go to our service people it doesn't go to our vets it, it doesn't you know 
it doesn't go to actually make the nation safer. But, but, but if we start with those three, in this, the 21st century, we have to look at this problem of, of the climate crisis, of, of ecological devastation, and actually how that impacts poor and marginalized communities the most, right? Um, the, the storms that, that are wreaking havoc, you know, in Puerto Rico or in North Carolina, um, or in Mississippi, um, the, the kind of, uh, you know, the, the pollution of our water systems and our air and our land, um, the pipelines, you know, just all of these kinds of, of things. And, and then we said, we, we look at those four issues, but then we also have to see the connection to this distorted narrative, this moral narrative of, of religious or, or mostly white Christian nationalism that, that helps to cloak um, and kind of connect all of these things. Now, so, so most issues are connected to those five, right? Um, but, but then we also try to work very intersectionally with other movements and other organizations that, that have identified other key injustices in our society, especially movements and networks that are also being um, led by those that are most impacted right um because it, it it's an important uh kind of theory of how societies get better is to see that those that are most impacted have to be a part of the solution to to solving those problems and and so in the case of poverty in the case of racism in the case of ecological devastation you need poor impacted poor communities um in the forefront of those struggles amazing amazing so there's so much more I want to ask you, but I'm going to close with one last question, a personal question. This work is so hard. It's so hard and it's exhausting. And I don't have to tell you that. Um, but how do you sustain yourself in this? What keeps you going in this, in this work day in and day out? So I think it, it, is, it is crushing, right? I mean, to, to, to be in a community like Aberdeen, Washington, where of the 16,000 people that live there, a thousand of them are homeless. And it's mostly poor white millennials, you know, who, who have, have no future, um, you know, or to be in Lowndes County, Alabama, um, right between Montgomery and Selma, you know, where, where freedom fighters marched right through. Um, and there's raw sewage in people's yards and kids are playing in that. Um, uh, and so, so it is crushing, right? Um, and yet, in those very places, people are coming together in ways that are just kind of unimaginable. And so, so what really sustains me is like these real heroes and heroines of our society that aren't usually talked about in our faith communities or on the TV or in the newspaper, but, but who are just every day, despite the fact that life is so hard, despite the fact that there's another attack coming every day, um, are with able to have the courage and the insight and the love and hope that it doesn't have to be this way, right? And, and to me, that's actually truly what faith is as a faith leader, is, is not that like good things will happen to people that have had good things happen to them, but that faith is that even out of the deepest, darkest places, something better is possible. And, and, and these are pretty dark times. Um, and so to see that, you know, in the words of, uh, of our, uh, you know, a text of a favorite text of mine in the, in the Christian New Testament, that the rejected are kind of the cornerstone of a movement who are, are, uh, um, who are building a, a revival in this land, right? And so, so I see that. I see that all over, and that gives me great hope, and it great, gives me, you know, the courage and and the, the tenacity, and and just like we have to do it because it, it just it it can't be this way, you know. And I look at my kids and I say, you know, what kind of future do they have, and what kind of future do their friends have, and uh, it needs to be better than than the world that that we're living in now. Amazing, amazing, I mean, I mean. Friends, uh, be sure to f follow Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris's work. Thank you so much for your time and continue. Thank your you. Time.